Good evening and welcome to First Coal Rain. Uh, my name is James Hindman, I'm the minister here and on behalf of our church family can I welcome you all. It is a great delight to host this service for the Northern Ireland Kin Kidney Research Fund this evening uh, when Jim uh, McCacken, who is my uh, ma minister, mentor and friend, asked me. Uh, we were jumped at the opportunity to uh, host this service for the Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund. And also uh, we knew that he was bringing along the Counterpoint Choir and guests, and so we were absolutely delighted with that. It's a thrill for us uh, to do that, um, especially the Counterpoint Choir especially the counterpoint choir. They always hit all the right notes, <laughs> but not necessarily. <laughs> You've obviously heard them before. <laughs> it is a huge privilege to welcome them tonight and uh, our very own Peter Wilson. Thank you for leading them and agreeing to serve in this way this evening. You're very welcome and I hope that you enjoy your time with us this evening. I'd like to thank James for his warm welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. It's great to have all of you here. We're here to worship, so let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet here tonight to worship you. We thank you for the freedom we have in this country to come together like this. We thank you for the health to be here when others would love to have come but are unable to. And we thank you for the promise that when we meet like this to worship you, that you will be here among us. Lord, we remember that you're the one who made the sun and the stars and the galaxies that swirl in the night sky. And when we think of that, we are amazed that you should lay your hand on us and bring us here tonight to meet with yourself. And so we do not hesitate to draw near to you. You have said that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all that is wrong. 
And so, Father, we ask that you will pardon us for the ways that we have fallen far short, for the opportunities to do good which we didn't take, for the good intentions that we never got round to following up, for those things which we said which were thoughtless or insensitive or unkind or deliberately intended to be hurtful, for making big issues out of things that really didn't matter. Lord, we ask that you will pardon us for all of these things and the other sins that we haven't mentioned. And you know the ones which spring to our minds. And more, Father, we pray that you will give us the will and the strength to change our ways. Don't leave us forgiven, but unchanged. Renew our right spirit deep within us and help us to honour you in all the ways that we think and do. Lord Jesus, we remember how you went around healing the sick, <clears throat> that you cared for the welfare of everyone you met, physical, mental and spiritual. And so we come to give thanks for those who work so hard in these fields, for those who are diligent in research to try and find even better ways of helping those who suffer. And Lord, we ask that you will be with us as we worship tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm going to speak for a few minutes about Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund. The choir may want to sit down at this point, I think. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm going to tell you a little about kidneys and kidney disease and about the Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund. Later on, Dr. Chris Hill, one of our nephrologists in Belfast City Hospital, is going to tell us about some current developments in kidney research and how that will benefit patients. And towards the end of the service, the Reverend James Heinemann will turn our attention to the living God by whom we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Kidneys. Until really a, a few, just a few years ago, I didn't know where my kidneys were. I, I think I knew that I had two, but that was about it. Most of us have two kidneys, not everybody, but almost everyone. And they work like mad all of the time, day and night. <clears throat> what do they do? They regulate our blood pressure. They enable the right level of hydration in our bodies. They help to produce red blood cells, which are mighty important. They maintain the right balance of minerals and chemicals in our bodies and they constantly purify our blood and any toxins are, are passed in our urine. And I think they do other things as well, but that's enough to be getting on with, isn't it? Every adult has around about five litres of blood and all of it is filtered by our kidneys in approximately every four minutes. In other words, every 24 hours, 1,800 litres of blood is filtered and purified by our kidneys. For some of you who think in gallons, that's about 400 gallons every 24 hours. So they are very busy. <clears throat> but kidneys can go wrong, as everything can go wrong. In fact, kidney disease is a public health emergency. A report uh, brought out just at the end of last year was flagging this up. Kidney disease, a public health emergency. It's estimated that 10% of the global population 
is affected by chronic kidney disease. And millions die every year in countries where treatment, uh, affordable treatment is not available. Every year. In 1990, chronic kidney disease was ranked 27th in the list of diseases that lead to death worldwide. 27th. 20 years later, it was 18th. And it's predicted that by 2040, which isn't that far away, it will be the fifth leading cause of death worldwide. A growing health problem, which affects all ages. I don't know if you noticed, we have produced little Easter cards in Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund. And we have a, a sample of about half a dozen different ones on the vestibule table. Some of them were produced by the children of Hazlett Primary School, who had a competition for it, and they produced some lovely ones. This one was produced by Cluda Annette. It shows an Easter egg cracked open and a happy, healthy kidney coming out. <laughs> Cluda is seven years old, and she's in the Royal Hospital for six children, and she needs a kidney. It affects all ages. We have seven dialysis units in Northern Ireland. One of them is in the, the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Belfast. There is no cure for kidney disease. There's no cure for kidney disease. In the past, and in poor countries around the world still, people simply deteriorate and do not recover. But now, a patient can receive dialysis, which is a way of doing what normal healthy kids do 24-7. A person on dialysis, a person's blood is diverted through a machine which removes all the impurities and channels your clean blood back into your body. Sounds lovely and simple. But if you ever talk to someone who's been on it, and I know there are a few people here tonight who have had kidney transplants, and they will tell you that to go on dialysis means lying in a bed for four hours, three days a week. And at the end of it, you're absolutely drained totally exhausted. But you begin to pick up, you have a few good days, and then you feel yourself, the toxins start to build up again, and you have to go again for dialysis. And it's really difficult, really difficult. The good news is that it keeps you alive, but only for so long. Seven dialysis units in Northern Ireland, around 800 patients on dialysis now. In, well, they're not receiving it just now, but uh, on dialysis at present throughout Northern Ireland. But it's very expensive treatment, and so it is quite severely rationed. And in poor countries, it's simply not available. 1954, <clears throat> that's 70 years ago. Ronald Herrick was dying of kidney disease in Boston. He was in the Brigham Hospital. But on the 23rd of December, 1954, Dr. Joseph Murray transplanted a kidney from somebody else into his body. Things like that had been tried before. People had dreamed about it. Dr. Murray, no doubt, had removed things like an appendix or a growth or something from people. Nobody had ever put something into another person's body before successfully. But Richard Herrick, Ronald's twin brother, had given a kidney. And Ronald received it. What about Richard? How did he manage without his kidney? Well, he had one. He had two altogether. He still had one perfectly good kidney. And any of us can live perfectly well on one healthy kidney. 
So he was okay, and before long, Ronald was okay as well. In fact, he lived another eight years, and when he died, his kidney was still fine, working beautifully. It was he died of a completely unrelated condition. It was a wonder. So in the 1950s, successful identical twin transplants were carried out. That raises an issue, doesn't it? If you are not an identical twin, put your hand up, please. Peter, are you an identical twin? Oh, you, right. You should have put your hand up. <laughs> I thought James would have had you all doing what he told you to do. <laughs> no. If you are an identical twin, any identical twins here? Yes. One. Two. One. One. I looked up Google, which always tells the truth, as you know, and it says one person globally in every 333 is an identical twin. So there's about 333 of us here tonight, and you're the one. <laughs> well, in the 1950s, with your exception, any of us who had had chronic kidney disease would not have had any hope at all. But people did research and they tried things that had never been tried before. Very, very risky things. Of course, if you only have one outlook and you're said, this might work or it might not, you'd be happy to try it. And so, thanks to research, they found they were able to do transplants from people who were not identical twins, which was great news for me and for lots of you here, nearly everybody here tonight. And that's where the Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund comes in. You see, without research, there's no progress. And without progress, there's no hope. For over 50 years, we have been funding research in Northern Ireland into the causes and treatment of kidney disease. Kidneys are the only organs that are transplanted in Northern Ireland. And there are over 100 people involved in each transplant operation. Obviously, a kidney has to be harvested, so that's a major operation. And then it has to be transported to where the other person is, and some t quite often uh, this means flying it across from Birmingham or Glasgow or London or wherever it happens to be, and another operation in Belfast. So it is a major procedure. Two operations connected very, very carefully. Most of the kidneys, I understand, come from deceased donors. Others come from a family member or a friend who donates one. Or some come from an altruistic donor. That's someone who contacts um, Belfast City Hospital, probably, and says, uh, I would like to give a kidney to someone who needs one. I have two. I don't need them if I can help somebody else. I'd be glad to. But how successful are these transplant operations? It's very complex. What sort of rate of success do you think we could seriously expect? 70%? That'd be quite good, wouldn't it? More than that? Well, for adults receiving their first kidney in Belfast from a deceased donor, 94% are successful. 94%. When I asked one of our surgeons and was told that, I checked it wasn't 49% or something. Did I hear that right? 94%. And from a living donor, 99%. It is phenomenal, 
phenomenal. In 2019, the British Transplant Society acknowledged that currently Northern Ireland is the leading country in the world for living donation. The leading country, our, our wee patch, the leading country in the world for living donation. <clears throat> now, usually if someone has chronic kidney disease, you have to find a kidney which is matching blood type and matching tissue type. Otherwise, your immune system would reject it. But thanks to research, that's no longer the case. And I have met people who were told they couldn't be transplanted at all. And then they came to Belfast and they said, yes, we can do that. It's called an incompatible transplant, which I took to mean an impossible transplant. And it was, but isn't anymore. Very difficult, very risky. But we have surgeons in Belfast who are able to make it work. Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund. We are the only Northern Ireland charity funding kidney research. The only one funding kidney research. The only Northern Ireland charity. All the money we raise is used in Northern Ireland to fund local researchers. Since our charity was founded 50 years ago, 90% of our income has gone to kidney research. We're very, very mean with our money. We try not to spend it on anything that is not absolutely essential. And the result is that anyone who finds themselves ill with chronic kidney disease, Northern Ireland is one of the very best places in the world to be. If you would like to help us, and the fact that you're here, I think, means that you probably are, please read the little leaflet inside your order of service. And when you've read it, pass it on to someone else who you think would be interested or could be interested. You can visit the NIKRF website and follow us on social media. You can come along to the events on the back page of your order of service. That's why we put them there. Or, of course, you can do a transplant. Not a kidney transplant, but a cash transplant from your account to our account. Now, from here on, the service will run largely unannounced. Uh, and right now, we're going to join to sing our next hymn, I will sing the wondrous story.
next two pieces by the choir evoke and elevate the wonder of God. With a voice of singing is an enduring favourite from Martin Shaw's repertoire, and this choral classic of just over 100 years is a vibrant piece with fanfare-like chords and choral parts, alternating unison phrases and straightforward harmonies, arousing, celebrating, and boldly declaring. Be Still for the Presence of the Lord is a product of the 80s, apparently written in one hour by British composer David Evans during a quiet time with God. He was involved in the charismatic movement, but this hymn is his response to the more trivial aspects of its worship. The lyrics draw inspiration from the Old Testament, Jacob waking from his sleep to declare, surely the Lord is in this place, and some echoes of Moses at the burning bush. The lines no work too hard for him in faith receive him are different calls to face the many battles and struggles that life presents, to stand still with the assurance that God will bring victory, quite simply that the Holy One is here and nothing else will matter.
Thank you, Peter, for the invitation to be here tonight for such a wonderful charity. Absolutely. I'm going to be singing two pieces for you tonight. Um, the second piece is a hymn which I wrote some years ago called Christ for Me. And I'm going to ask you to help me with the chorus, and I hope you enjoy that one. But the first piece <clears throat> is a piece called People Need the Lord, and perhaps an unusual choice for, for Palm Sunday. But every time I think of Palm Sunday, I think of Jesus entering into Jerusalem where the crowds were screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, and laying the palm leaves before him and clothes and garments. And the very same people, just a few days later, 
would probably have been among the throng who cried, crucify him, crucify him. You know, people can be very fickle. Maybe you didn't know that. Friends, family sometimes can be very fickle. But I'm so thankful that tonight we serve a God whose love is constant, who never changes. His mercy and His grace never changes. And so this song is about people who, who are not aware of that love, of that grace, of that mercy in their lives. And as we approach Easter, I think of many friends, family members, colleagues who don't know this love. And as I sing this song, I hope that you perhaps will bring to your remembrance a face or a a family member or a friend who doesn't know the joy and the love that we experience because of his great love. People need the Lord. Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where On they go through private pain Living fear to fear Laughter hides their silent cries Only Jesus hears People need the That 
I'm just going to have a glass of water, if that's okay. Some water. We have so much to sing about. And I just thank him publicly for what he's done in my life and for what he's done in so many lives today. We serve a great, great God. I told you about a hymn I wrote uh, some years ago, uh, and it was composed during the middle of the night. I'd never intended to be a hymn writer uh, or anything, but I started to pen thoughts and prayers down, a bit like Fanny Crosby, although I'd never compare myself to her. But she used to write her songs at the middle of the night when it was quiet, when the traffic noise levels would die down and she could concentrate. As you all know, she was blind. And she would write her songs in the middle of the night. So Christ for me was a prayer that I wrote down and the melody came. And I want you to help me with the chorus. It's very, very simple. And I think we've got the words. Have we got the words on the screen, David? Yep. So that's the first verse. Can we move through maybe to the, would that be throwing you guys off if we go straight to the chorus? Um, which says the next one. That's it. Les, can we have a go? Feel free, guys, give me a wee hand. Let's, the chorus goes like this. The chorus goes, Oh, bleeding lamb of Calvary, who gave his life unselfishly for no one else could set me free Christ for me Christ for me good you're getting it try it oh pleading lamb of Calvary who gave his life unselfishly for Please feel free to join with me in the chorus and the verses if you know them. Christ for me, a love so deep, I trust in Him, in Him complete. There's no greater story told. Christ for me, Christ for me, Christ for me, all else will fail, but Calvary's love grows stronger still than all the words that man has spent. Christ for me, Christ for me. Join with me. Oh, bleeding Lamb of Calvary, who gave His life unselfishly, for no one else could set me free. Christ for me, Christ for me. Darkness comes and thunders roll When guilt and fear hold fast my soul I'll stand upon His Word and know Christ for me, Christ for me Oh, bleeding Lamb of Calvary who gave his life unselfishly for no one else could set me free Christ for me Christ for me and when I take my final breath 
I'll take the hand that conquered death and rise to meet him face to face. Christ for me, Christ for me. Oh, bleeding Lamb of Calvary, who gave his life unselfishly, for no one else could set me free. Christ for me. One more time. Selfishly, for no one else could set me free. Christ for me, Christ for me, for no one else could set me free. Christ for me. Christ for me. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Reverend McCacken and Mrs. McCacken and the rest of the Kidney Research Fund for the invite to come and speak tonight. Um, uh, a long time ago, when I was a young lad and had certainly much more hair on the top of my head, um, the Kidney Research Fund uh, gave me some money to do some research, so I'm always very happy to pay them back where I can. Um, I've been a consultant in the city hospital for just shy of 10 years now, which makes me feel really old when I say that. So, um, and. I guess uh, I wanted to talk a little bit tonight just about um, what research has been done and is being done in Northern Ireland um, at the minute. Um, I should also say I'm not some blue in from the big smoke. I'm uh, a Ballymoney boy by heart. Um, God bless my wife, who, uh, a coal rain girl by heart, who married me and took on that trouble. Um, so. Um, so, uh, in terms of kidney disease, I guess the way I think about it is in, there are three groups. There are the, the persons who um, have something wrong with their kidneys but haven't reached the point of dialysis or a kidney transplant. Then there are those who are on dialysis and those who have been transplanted. And really, um, in every one of those groups in Northern Ireland, we do research and we're involved um, in research. So, in the people who aren't on, uh, who aren't on dialysis who, or who haven't needed a transplant yet, um, we've been involved in the last few years in a multinational drug trial um, of a drug that was first designed to treat diabetes, but now has been shown to significantly reduce loss of kidney function in, uh, in people who have kidney disease, such that uh, some people it, re it will reduce the risk of kidney failure by about a third over about four to five years, which is a massive change. Um, the Kidney Research Fund is directly, um, at the moment, uh, funding Dr. Michael Toole, who's one of our uh, research registrars. He's doing a study looking at one of the other um, common uh, kidney diseases that we see all the time, and really looking at how we can pick that disease up, those diseases up earlier, diagnose them, and therefore uh, treat them. Um, and although this is the Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund, uh, it certainly has worldwide reach. So Michael uh, did a survey of kidney doctors across the world looking at when they would do a kidney biopsy test, which is one of the most common investigations we do. And he has so far, at the last count, managed to get over a thousand replies from 50 different countries. So um, the, the money from the Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund has definitely gone worldwide in that respect. 
In dialysis patients, as you've heard Reverend McCacken talk about, dialysis is not nice. It's not a nice place to be. It's not a nice life. You would only do it if you absolutely had to. And that's partly because um, dialysis patients um, are at higher risk of other conditions, particularly heart disease. So at the moment, we're involved in a, a trial of a, actually a really old and very common and very cheap drug called spironolactone to see if that reduces the incidence of heart disease and strokes and things like that in the dialysis population. My, uh, one of my predecessors, uh, uh, Professor Peter Maxwell, who's uh, spoken at other uh, kidney research fund events over the years, did a huge amount of research over his 30 plus years in the job, including you know, big trials looking at um, the use of medications to boost people's blood count, so to get more red blood cells out in their system if they're on dialysis. And even at the moment, we've got our, uh, the Queen's University, their School of Nursing, um, have a research group that are really interested in kidney disease. And one of the big things they look at is muscle wasting in persons on dialysis, because a lot of people who are on dialysis get significant muscle wasting, which as you can imagine, then has a really uh, uh, significant negative impact on their life in general. And then last, but by uh, no means least, um, is our uh, transplant program. And, you know, I, I don't have a huge amount to add other than to say that when I started in nephrology training uh, back in 2009, um, we did about 50 transplants a year in Belfast, and these days we do almost three times that as a, as a routine um, every year. Um, it has changed the landscape of kidney disease in Northern Ireland and taken a huge uh, number of people off dialysis who would otherwise have... Um, you know, potentially languished there for a number of years waiting for kidneys uh, to come along. And I know that somewhere in the audience is, uh, or in the congregation I should say, is uh, Dr Ruth Fergie, who's at the minute about to try to crawl behind a chair somewhere. Ah, oh, there you are Ruth. Um, who uh, is also currently uh, partly funded by the Kidney Research Fund. And her research at the moment is looking at um, the impact of frailty on the outcomes after transplant. So how do people do if they're more frail? How long do their kidneys last? And we've even got, uh, at the moment, we have a, a surplus of uh, research registrars. We've got another uh, uh, called uh, Dr. Michael Kaur, who's doing a PhD looking at the other end of the kind of age spectrum in young people who get transplanted and um, what happens to them. Why, why do younger persons have a higher risk of losing their kidney? Because we don't actually really know at the moment. We assume it's you know, teenage years, bit of rebelliousness, not taking your tablets, but actually it's probably not just that. So um, it is, uh, there's a huge amount of work ongoing at the moment. And actually this is, a, um, for me professionally, this is a really exciting uh, time to be working in kidney disease because again, when I started in kidney training, for many kidney conditions, the best that you could do was effectively to control someone's blood pressure and then prepare them for what was coming 10, maybe 20 years down the line as in dialysis or a kidney transplant. But really within the last probably three years, there's been a huge explosion worldwide in looking at new treatments um, uh, for kidney disease. You know, the, the trial I talked about right at the start, that came almost out of nowhere because it was a diabetes drug. Um, but we have a huge number of new uh, research opportunities. And to be absolutely truthful, you know, we would not be able to do a lot of the research that we do without the support of the Kidney Research Fund. And obviously, they can't support us without the help of uh, kind folks like yourselves. So, um, uh, as uh, Reverend McCacken said, consider one of those bank uh, tr transplants tonight if you can. Um, and uh, I think that's probably all I've got to say. So, I shall get out of here and let you listen to somebody who's got a nicer voice than me, okay? The words of our next piece, For the Beauty of the Earth, emphasize what theologians call general revelation, how the wonders of creation and the joy of human love speak of God's love. The original eight stanza versions was written by the Anglican hymn writer Folliot Pierpoint in 1864 and was first used as a communion hymn. The version we are singing to the melody composed by Philip Stubford in 2003 for St Anne's Cathedral in Belfast is much shorter. 
and emphasizes our thankfulness and praise for all God's good gifts. But the special revelation on which that thankfulness is fully based only becomes clear when we come to our fifth piece, God So Loved the World, written by the distinguished composer John Stainer, 1840 to 1901, and 1887 with the text by W.J. Sparrow Simpson. It is part of the oratory of the crucifixion, a meditation on the sacred passion of the Holy Redeemer, and was first performed in February 1887, the day after Ash Wednesday. Knighted in 1888, Steiner was professor of music at Oxford from 89 to his death, very distinguished. But the message is clear. Based on John 3, 16 and 17, it sounds out the story of the gospel, the special revelation of God in Jesus Christ, the word of God who took upon himself the sins of the world and has brought eternal life. Our Lord's suffering comes out in the music and resonates with the fact that the crowds, as we have heard already, who welcomed Jesus to Jerusalem with palm leaves on Palm Sunday saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, were those who rejected him on Good Friday since they were looking for a Messiah as earthly conqueror. But Jesus did go to the cross. He died. He rose again. God so loved the world, and we glory in that.
The reading is taken from Numbers chapter 6, beginning at verse 22. The priestly blessing. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Amen. And now we all get the opportunity to join and sing God's praise in the hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. moment we will be receiving the offering for the Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund and as it's being collected um, the organist is going to play the melody of the benediction which we will all sing together at the end. I think the words are going to go up on the screen now and I think Edwin is going to sing it for us, yes? So as the offering is received Please watch the words and we'll be singing this together later. If you know it, please join in.
Father and the grace of Christ the risen Son and the fellowship of God the Spirit keep our hearts and minds within his love and to him be praised for his glorious reign from the depths of earth to the heights of heaven we declare the name of the Lamb once slain Christ eternal the King of kings may this be which passes understanding and this grace which makes us what we are and this fellowship of his communion make us one in spirit and in heart and to him Thank you so much indeed. If you've really enjoyed the Counterpoint Choir tonight, you can hear them again on Saturday the 22nd of June at 7.30 p.m. in a little church in Korean called St. Patrick's Church. Now, I have no idea where that is, <laughs> but I'm sure that you'll find it. Saturday the 22nd of June, 7.30, the Counterpoint Choir with special guests. If you've enjoyed them tonight, you'll enjoy them then. Thank you so much indeed. Let's pray together. Father God, you've given us so many good and perfect gifts. What do we have that we did not receive? And yet we boast so often that we did not. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace to us. And we thank you especially tonight for the work of the Northern Ireland Kindly Research Fund, for the work that it does in supporting encouraging and giving to the work of research into kidney disease. Father, we bless you tonight for all that we've heard about the work that goes on in Northern Ireland, the wonderful work, the sterling work. And we pray that in your mercy and grace, you would bless this offering in some small way that it might be of benefit in the days and years to come. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I know little to nothing about kidneys or kidney research, but I do know from personal experience the value of the work of the Kidney Research Fund. My mother was on dialysis for the last two years of her life and went three times a week to Antrim Area Hospital where she received dialysis. And she actually died not of kidney disease, but of heart failure in the kidney dialysis unit at Antrim Hospital. As a family, we were very thankful indeed for all of the support and love of the staff there for the two extra years that they gave to us uh, to be with my mum, for the extra time that we were given with her, and for all of their love and support during that time. I know very little about kidneys, but I do know a great deal about the blessing of God. And so when I thought about tonight, I thought of us turning toward this wonderful blessing that's recorded for us in Numbers chapter 6 that was so beautifully read for us. I wonder, did you notice in the news this week that David Beckham was in Northern Ireland? He arrived apparently at the airport in Belfast and he jumped into a taxi. And as they drove off, he, he saw that the driver was quizzically looking at him in the rearview mirror 
And eventually the driver asked, are you going to give me a clue? Well, David said, I was a Manchester United midfield superstar for many years. I made over 100 caps for England and I married a Spice Girl. Does that give you any help? Not really, said the driver. I was just wanting to know where you're going. <laughs> Our reading tonight from Numbers is one of the well, most well-known and most beautiful blessings in all the Bible. It's rich, it's deep in its meaning. I could spend a whole year on a series just talking about this blessing, but I know that we don't have time for that tonight. Let me just point you to two things, two really important things. And the first is this, God knows you. God knows you. In 1979, archaeologists were digging in the Hinnom Valley uh, just outside of Jerusalem. And in a cave, archaeologists found two little silver amulets. And when they studied the amulets, they discovered that there was writing on them. And it was an inscription, in fact, a very ancient form of Hebrew. And it turned out to be the oldest recorded written Hebrew known. Three words stood out. They're translated in our reading from Numbers, L-O-R-D, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. But that's the translation of the Hebrew name Yahweh, God's covenant name. And those, that name repeated three times indicated to the archaeologists immediately that this was the ironic blessing of Numbers chapter 6. But the interesting thing is that the word that is repeated most often in that blessing is not Yahweh, Lord. It's the word you, the singular personal pronoun, you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance, his face upon you and give you peace. This is a blessing on you tonight. And not only does God know you, secondly, he wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. The word bless actually means to kneel. To kneel, to serve. Those who first heard this blessing could not have even begun to imagine what we now know, what we now celebrate this week coming. How this blessing would be fulfilled when Yahweh stooped, knelt to become human stooped and knelt to wash his disciples' feet, stooped, knelt and humbled himself to death on a cross for you and for me to bless us. Not only does God know you, he wants to bless you. He has a plan for you. He knows where you are going. He has a plan for your future to bless you and to keep you. When Aaron the priest at the end of the morning and evening sacrifices was told to say this blessing over the people of Israel, he was told to stretch out his arms and give them this blessing. This blessing is so deep and so rich. If you read it in your Bible uh, tonight when you go home, you'll see, uh, look up the Hebrew. I know you all have a Hebrew Bible at home. Look up the Hebrew and you'll discover that the blessing is in three lines. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Three lines. Each of those three lines has three words, then five words, 
and then seven words. It's an expanding blessing. And if you count the letters of the Hebrew, you'll discover that it goes from line one, 15 letters, to line two, 20 letters, to line three, 25 letters. And if you add up 15 and 20 and 25, you get... (laughs) Time's going on. 60. 60. And those of you who are Hebrew scholars will know well, as I looked up on Google, that the 60th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the letter Samach. And Samach means to hold, to keep. You know that Hebrew letters and numbers are the same thing. The 15th letter of the alphabet is Samach. And it means 60. It's the number 60. And it means to keep and to hold. What you may not know is that whenever Aaron the priest stretched out his hands over the people of Israel, he didn't just stretch them out like this. He stretched them out like, well, I can't hardly do it. Do you know what that is? Those of you of a certain age, he stretched them out like that over the people. It makes the figure Samak in Hebrew, in the center. That's what he was to do, stretch it out. And you know why he did that with both hands? Because do you know how many bones there are in each arm and hand? There are three bones in your elbow, in your arm. 27 in your hand makes 30. And the same in the other makes 60, which is the letter Samak, which means to hold or to keep. So in the words and in the actions, in the letters, in the numbers, God is saying to you, I know you, I want to bless you, I want to hold you, I want to keep you. This Easter time, remember this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The choir are going to sing a Gaelic blessing. Um, And sometimes it's also known as a deep peace. This was first, uh, this was composed by John Rutter and first performed in 1978. He based the words on a Celtic poem and adapted these to add Christ, the light of the world, to make it a more Christian anthem. Every line begins with the beautiful words, deep peace, referring to elements of nature, the running wave, the flowing air, the quiet earth, the shining stars, and it builds to a crescendo when we sing deep peace of Christ to you. Christ, the light of the world, deep peace.
On behalf of the Coleraine and Ballymoney Northern Ireland Kidney Research Fund Group, I would like to thank a number of people without whom this service just would not have happened. First of all, I want to thank the Kirk Session and the Minister of First Coleraine for granting us the use of this lovely place of worship and for all those in the congregation who have helped in so many practical ways. Such is the level of organisation here that Janice actually sent me a spreadsheet of the military operation which has been mobilised for this evening. Please do stay for supper. You won't regret it. And we want to thank the wonderful Counterpoint Choir and in particular Peter Wilson, their choir master, who enthusiastically embraced this evening right from the start. Leslie McGee, our harpist, Andrew Harrison on the organ, Adrian Miller on the trumpet, and Edwin Brown, our soloist. It has just been a marvellous evening of praise, and we are deeply grateful to all of you. We were delighted to welcome Dr. Chris Hill back to his own part of the world, as he's originally from Ballymoney, and clearly very smart, for he married a girl with roots in Articliffe. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, for updating us about kidney research. And Dr. Ruth Fergie, who is currently carrying out important research on the frailty of kidney patients, Thank you so much, Ruth, for doing our Bible reading. And of course, our good friend, the Reverend James Heinemann, for all that he has contributed to the planning and delivery of this service. Thank you so much, James. And finally, we thank God for all his goodness, for the gifts that he has given to those involved in kidney research for the benefit of so many people, for the gifts that he has given to those who perform transplant operations, and for the compassion he gives to those who care for kidney patients, and not least for the good health which so many of us enjoy and sometimes take for granted. So let us all join together to sing with all our hearts, to God be the glory.
Let's sing together the benediction.